It's um, building envelope and air tightness. Uh, Joseph's background is in architecture. Architect by training. By training. Um, and now he knows everything that you need to know about building air tightness. I pretend, and duck as, as good architect do. <laughs> and also duck ceiling. We got a very good overview from early in the morning, working down the food chain from the top, from the client universities to the consulting engineers to the mechanical suppliers and system contractors. Now we come to the bottom of the food chain, who actually go on site and get hands and feet dirty. Uh, well, I don't usually dress up like this. That's what we do, half of our company do air tightness testing. These are some of the setup, and you can see a lot of messy equipments involved in doing that. But before we go any further, why do we care about air tightness? I think most of you should already have some appreciation why it's important from the whole morning, and I'm going to sound like a broken record again. Air leakage infiltration affect thermal comfort of occupants, uneven temperature inside, indoor air quality, because yes, it's outside air, but outside air doesn't equate to fresh air. Infiltration, the air comes in, is not filtered or treated, so it affects your indoor air quality. Structural stability, integrity, I think you've heard enough from Sam about what are the potential issues caused by condensation, rusting, rotting, and potential mold growth in your timber frame, yadi yadi yadi. And of course, energy efficiency, that's one of the main things we cover today. For mechanical contractors and control specialists, how could they balance if we got leaky building and ductwork? When a day got windy, you got a lot of pressure coming from the wind on your facade, your air conditioning system can't even put air into that room, let alone evenly distributed around. And that is one of the things that even some of the mechanical engineering graduates don't understand. They thought they are putting certain volume of air into that space, but in fact they are only creating a pressure difference between before and after the fan and try to use that pressure to push that volume of air that they think go into the space, into the space. But if you got more pressure from the space pushing back based on wind or anything else, you can get back flow. And none of the air that you intend to go in there will go in there. I think most of you have worked in um, office buildings. How many of you feel uncomfortable in your work um, station in the past. Maybe now, but I'm only asking in the past. Yep. How many of you feel you don't have enough air in your space? Feel stuffy, stagnant, or too much air? These are all symptoms of the imbalancing that may, just may, it could be the mechanical contractor or something, someone not doing their job properly, but I believe most of them should do a reasonably good job, but it could be caused by the building envelope. Oversizing of plan, we learned this morning the plan can be a third of the size if we have a tight building with an optimized system. And also the imbalance, the constantly changing pressure between different parts of the building can severely disturb the control. Um, how many of you have a um, mechanical background? Yep, and I think most of you should have some understanding that most of the um, mechanical system, air conditioning system, are controlled by a couple um, temperature sensors. One, in the space, of course, if it is too hot or too cold, we pump in conditioned air, and the other is from the return air, so we know what is going back to the system, that we know how much chilled water is going to go through the coils and blah, blah, blah. If you've got a leaky building, what is going to happen? The outdoor air influencing your indoor sensor, but the pressure pushing back the conditioned air in your riser, going from your supply maybe directly to the return. And you've got a low return air temperature while you've got a 
warm temperature in the space. So what this system will do, sometimes they just get so frustrated and they do nothing. In some of the previous audit that we do on certain building control, we find that happens. The building just shut and the chiller is not providing um, chilled water to the coil because the return air temperature is cold. But the fan keeps running like crazy because the room needs conditioning. So that is not the outcome that you want to see. This one, I don't think I'm going to go too much into it. It's just talking about the discrepancy between the predicted um, neighbor's performance when um, a lot of the Green Star project went through to the actual performance. Some of them go slightly better, but most of them go way worse than predicted. What are the reasons? And air tightness can be one of the major contributors because it can affect the flow on effect on a lot of the other components. Now we come to the nitty gritty. I'm going to go through each one of them, not. This is just one of the um, diagram to help all of you to appreciate what can go wrong, what potentially will go wrong, what is the Murphy's Law, what potentially can go wrong, will go wrong. So when we're considering building envelope air tightness, we need to consider every single possible source. And air tightness is a numbers game. What does it mean? Okay, when I talk about whether the ceiling or air tightness what is the first thing come in mind? Windows and doors. Yes, most people think about windows and doors and they worry about all the gaps and cracks when they see things like that. You see lights through, that means you got air passed through that. In a double doors like that, it's not a small door. If you got two mil, even up to five mil gap around, it, you got 160 to 300 centimeters square of gap, which is a fair bit of gaps. But when you talk about your parapet detail around your roof, even just a two mil gap around 300 meters of your perimeter, we are talking about 6,000 centimeters square. All the tiny bit, they add up, and it creates a much bigger impact than something that we can easily see and appreciate. This is some CFD diagrams, it looks great. I put that up there just to keep you guys from sleeping. So don't pay too much attention. All I want to show is there is significant pressure difference between different size, different facade, different heights of the building. And if you don't seal the building properly, your indoor space, especially those in the perimeter zones, will follow the pressure outside. Imagine here you got a very high pressure acting on the facade and your air handling unit is sitting on top of the roof where the venturi effect would create a suction. Mm -hmm. How much pressure your fan is providing? Can your fan overcome both the suction and the pressure coming from the inside? On some windy day at some windy hour, it may not be able to do it. Why air barrier? What is wrong with our building? What is wrong with the current practice? Usually I would say there are three main contributors. Architects have not paid sufficient attention to detailing the air barrier. That's a polite way to say it, but in most of the case, the Australian architects, they never receive training or education on what air barrier is and they absolutely got no clue what that is. Even if they want to, they may not have the knowledge to try to do it. But if they are willing to educate themselves, there's plenty of material from international. And then builders generally overlook those details. Of course, it's in their best interest to know nothing about it. So they don't have to spend extra dime on doing any of this as long as they follow the architect's detail to build it, any problem they can blame, oh, it's a design issue. And last but not least, our trade, aren't they wonderful? <laughs> when they come into a building, they need to install something, they just get a latch hammer for putting in a cable. They can punch a hole that big for no reason. 
but that's the way they used to do it. And they never patch things up until you send them a back charge. Then they are more than happy to come back and do it. Here is a typical section of details. I just want to highlight some issue about what some architects, they try to learn what to do and they produce this detail, the red line representing an air barrier through this um, roof detail. It looks pretty good on a section of drawing, right? We got a continuous from the roof sheeting come around the structure and um, to minimize the penetration and come down behind and it all looks good until we come to three dimension. There's the roof. You got the membrane go through there, but what about this three dimensional corrugation? Uh oh, I didn't see that coming. And likewise, things like that, or they try to put up partition, but oh, the structure, the bracing in, in the way, what am I going to do? Well, no one is going to see it, the floor ceiling is going to come in, forget it. And do you know, do you think the air will follow our arrows in the drawings and not go up there? I don't think so. As Sam and Mark and Stuart said, air are unruly. They never follow our arrows. Just some other problems or common practice. You see gaps and cracks and plasterboard not touching the slab, uncorked um, skirting board um, here and there when the um, steel panels slightly bend, they don't even bother to tape it up or seal it up. And when you can see daylight come in, of course, air coming in, unless there's a piece of glass or perspex in there, but it, who would have thought there would be one up there? Trays, when they need penetration, they take out the whole block. This one, he's trying, he's quarter-hearted, but not quite there. Likewise, you've seen that one, they try to patch up to reduce, at least they not taking the whole plasterboard out, but you still got plenty of um, air leakage around. Details like that. What makes a good air barrier? After we know what's the problem, what constitutes a good air barrier? First, we need to select the appropriate target. Not every project got a billion dollars sitting there for us to do all the seal, so we can throw the building in the sea and it still flow. No. So we need to select the appropriate target, the allowance on how much air can go past the building envelope. And feel free to talk to Sam or Dios guys. They will give you an idea what is the minimum requirement, the best or more appropriate optimum um, target that you can achieve. And we can sit down and talk about how much you need to spend to achieve that. And please remember, if you forget anything else, it's all right, please remember the next sentence. Air tightness doesn't need to cause you an arm and a leg. It's more about how you can push the builder to do things vigilantly. It's more about careful finishing things off rather than rocket science. Okay, it must be continuous through the entire building envelope. To some extent, doing air tightness is very similar to military operation. Um, have, I think most of you should know a little bit about the Second World War. A lot of the builder will take on the French strategy. <coughs> they work very hard on the wall, sealing every gaps and cranny like the French build up their defense. But what, the, what did the German do? They go around it. When the plasterer and the roofer did an excellent job to seal up the wall and the roof, but the joint, nobody cares about the joint because that is not in my tender package. That is his job, and he's saying, this is your job. 
And this is the small things that as a project manager or the one who initiate the contract needs to be careful about. The joints between trades, they are always the weakness and make or break the project. If you didn't do it right in the contractual time, you can hardly put the back charge to anyone. And if you can't do back charge, most builders will do. It's not my business. Simple as that. So it needs to seal the gaps around penetration, any pipe, conduit, duct, and wall to roof, wall to foundation, around windows and doors, all typical things. I don't think anything here surprised you, right? It just, you need to think about it um, methodically. And then these are something that many of us may not concern. The air tightness layer has to be able to withstand the force during and after construction. In some project that I got involved in, they specified to use membranes. But the way how they put the membranes in is problematic. They use simple staple to stick the membrane onto the timber frame without batten. And they use ordinary duct tape instead of the specialist uh, membrane tape to tape the joint between membranes. What is going to happen? Before you finish off the external and internal finish, there is something in this world called wind. It will flip the membrane. And when you just got a staple holding it, when you flip it, flip it, flip it, what's going to happen? It torn. And duct tape is not designed to hold things for too long without the elastic effect. So what has happened is, um, the first time we inspect, it looks great, it's still up tight. In four days, the tape just give way. And it equates to you put nothing in there. Once the seal is broken, it equates nothing. And then the durability of the um, material over the life of building, it is some other things like if you use ordinary silicon to do the sealing. How long do they last? Even on the tube, it tells you four to five years. After that, it will shrink and breaks. So you need to choose the appropriate type of sealer for the purpose. Before construction, in the design stage, there are a couple questions we need to ask. What are the airtight zones? Which zones need to be airtight? Usually, we connect that to air conditioning. Whenever a zone is air conditioned, we want it to be airtight. If it is fully permanently naturally ventilated space like car park or plant room, then you have the discretion to choose whether you want that to be airtight or not. Because sometimes for the um, integrity, you may want to have a double layer of airtightness around a plant room. Sometimes, usually not. Hybrid ventilator zone, uh, that's a bit tricky one. Depends on what you use to control your natural ventilation, how well your louvers or mechanized things works. Um, Semi-open courtyard, that's a really interesting option and it needs to be dealt with um, case by case. Depends on how the design of the semi-open courtyard is whether there is a possibility we can create a secondary air barrier on the inside between the courtyard and the occupied space. So it is very delicate exercise. Next, um, define the air barrier in building envelope must be continuous in all three dimensions. And very, very often we come into a trap that we only see one section of drawings. It looks good there, but how it joins to the other part of the building, we didn't consider. Must select the appropriate air barrier material and sealing techniques. Sometimes it may be good to use caulking. Sometimes you need to use membrane, depends on the gap size and the material you selected, how much thermal expansion and shrinkage, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of consideration needs to put in there. And then 
This is one thing that a lot of architects have difficulties to deal with, the construction sequence. You need to understand which component get in first so you can have some backing or support for your airtightness membrane before the next element come in. And in some area, in some instance like this drawing, if they design the air barrier is there, what is the temporary support? They need to put the purlins in first so that the membrane can sit on it before they penetrate the roof sheeting. All these sequencing consideration needs to be there. Otherwise, the builder would find it so hard. They usually, what builders does, they create a frame, put the roof on before they fit anything onto the wall because it's protected. But by that time, you can hardly deal with the junction between the roof frame and the wall. That one, you can't walk around or do anything. This is something is not, well, of course, you want the barrier to be inspectable before your final finish come on. That is just an allow yourself to see if there's no issue before you're closing it off. Once it closes off, you can still fix it, but it costs triple, if not five times. And then the next one is, a lot of builders find it hard to believe. Try to avoid double layering. If you design that your air barrier layer is on the inside, then you focus all your effort on the inside. Sometimes the builders are a little bit skeptical. They are not confident on what they are doing. They try to do multiple layers of air tightness. In theory, that's good. But in reality, the tray who actually gone to do the dirty work, they may think, oh, I do a pretty good job here. Even if I miss here and there, bits and pieces, there is another layer behind. It's the normal human psychic that if they feel that there is something they can fall back to, they won't be as vigilant as they should be. Ideally, it should attach to the thermal barrier, which is the insulation. The mechanical consultant and the architect should try to predefine where are the location for all the surfaces penetration. It makes it easier to control the tray and also easier for inspection to check the quality of all those penetration and whether they are being patched up properly. Most sure control do some of the um, situation they require vapor permeability but it may not be applicable for a situation like um, aquatic center. This is one of the examples in semi-three-dimensional diagram show where the air barrier or the um, envelope is. A lot of people will have the false perception that the suspended ceiling can be a, an air barrier or envelope, but there is a couple issues. You can't ensure in the life of the building People are not going to open and close and break ceiling tiles and also it's not properly attached to the thermal envelope which may cause issue that I will explain a bit more details and likewise for the raised floor system. And if you have different zones, even internal walls may need to be a part of the thermal envelope. For example, like an aquatic center, you don't want the air from your wet zone to go into your dry zone. Otherwise, you can start to grow some um, tropical rainforest plants in your gym or office area. Typically, if there's anyone involved in architectural design or detailing, usually the problem is where there is any transition, whether it is a geometric transition or a material transition. Those are the weak points that we need to look into to confirm the detail is going to maintain the air tightness. And the other thing that I will try to see if I can use this diagram to explain why the air barrier is better to stick with the thermal insulation. They, the manufacturer go through all the lab tests and show you the R value of the bulk um, fiberglass insulation is R1.5 or R3. But in real life, if you don't provide an air barrier attaching to those um, bulk insulation, if the outdoor air 
is moving into your wall cavity, do you think those bulk insulation would still remain the same insulating value, performance? First, if the air permeates through, it bypasses the insulation. If the air moving inside the insulation, or even though it just moves very slowly, it still brings the um, energy moving across, which greatly reduces your insulation performance. That is one of the reasons I strongly suggest to um, layer the air barrier with the thermal barrier. But if you're using something like hangspan panel, solid rigid insulation, then you don't have such an issue. And all the joints, you need to consider what kind of detail, what kind of angle you're going to use to allow for proper taping or attachment, what kind of grout or caulking you, you want to use, all those you need to consider. And this is one of the worst parts in most of the building we work on, the power pads detail. Most of them uninsulated, the, even some like this one, they got the air um, membrane, but it finished off at this top structure and there's no, nothing to say the connection between the external facade. So what happens is that bit becomes the jet of the outdoor air coming into the space and it's uninsulated, all your warm and moist air rise up there, it becomes like a fountain up there with condensing. And if we coordinate where the services penetrate through your building envelope, you can easily design proper details to, um, to seal it right. Now we move to the next part. When we do air tightness, it's great, it's good, but how do we know if we are up to scratch? We need to do testing to show um, performance demonstration or compliance. There are three main methods out there. The first one is chaser gas. We heard about a little bit about that this morning. The other is try to use the building's own HVAC system to check if we hold the pressure. And the last one is blower door testing, which is the most common and arguably the most accurate method. Tracer gas um, is a good method. It gives you direct ambient um, air leakage rate, how much air is changing under normal operation condition. Great. But the problem is it only takes a snapshot for that particular ambient condition. If you did the test on a steel day, it will only give you the performance on a steel day not on a windy day, you can hardly extrapolate the result from a tracer gas um, test to other condition. Using buildings on HVAC is good, it's convenient, you already pay for the system, but there are issues, you cannot get a um, quantifiable number in the accuracy that is required. Why? First, most of the fans are not calibrated, they have a nominal performance, pressure and flow relationship. Even if you calibrate a fan before you install it, all the fans connected to ductwork, how could you include the drag, the pressure drop from the ductwork into the calibration? You can't. And if you try to do calibration after you install the fan in the building, sorry, the ambient condition, the wind would mess that things up completely. So it's, it's good to have indicative performance, but it can't give you a number. There's other ways to test a building use blower door as well. One thing they, a lot of um, testers would propose is doing a facade test. They build a part of the facade and build a temporary enclosure to test the performance of the facade. It's great for learning to let the builder know what area can go wrong, so they, as a mock-up test, it's great. But if you try to get your overall performance of the building, it tells you minimal. Why? Because on one hand, your temporary structure may leak. The other, the leak between floors and between zones 
are also being measured as the performance of the facade. And more importantly, your building envelope is not just the facade and the roof. All the internal vertical shafts form a big part of your building envelope. Believe it or not, a large portion of your infiltration coming in and out is from all the internal shafts, your um, mechanical shafts, and the lift shafts. Have you had the experience on a windy day when you try to get into the lift, the tiny gap, 10, 15 mil gap, you feel boom, air moving across your face when you're walking into a lift? That's how much air is moving up and down through those shafts. And some other tester, they try to do a more simple, sneaky way, make their life easy. They just try to do one floor. Same problem, the air move between floors and go into the shaft are all being included. So it's not really helpful for DIOS to calibrate their system based on the test results like that. And it's not giving you a true picture of your external envelope. A lot of people call this a compartment test. And then this one is slightly better called a guarded blower door compartment test. You try to set up on three different levels. So you maintain the same condition between the three levels. So all the air leakage from this floor is to the outside. It sounds good, but it still hasn't fully addressed the issue of the internal shafts. Plus, to perform a test like that requires a lot of equipment and expertise to maintain the balance in pressure between different floors. So it sounds good in theory, but in practice, it's not that easy. And the last one is to get enough fans to test the entire building at one go. Well, it depends on the build quality. And if we can build a building the size of Rialto Tower with the standard of a passive house, we can comfortably test the whole Rialto Tower with the equipment that we currently have. When we do a test, anyone can do a test. Anyone have a fan can do a test for you. But you need to know which standard they are test to. They can be test to ISO standard or ATMA standard. As long as your tester is testing to an internationally reputable standard, it's all right. But don't just let everybody, anybody just come to you and tell you they can do a blower door test and give you a number. The result may just be the same as, um, I think this is 10. It doesn't make a difference. Quality control. How to do a good quality blower door test? Even if we, you got two different companies to do a test according to Edma test standard, they can still have different quality. From an insider point of view, always asking for fully automated tests. We need to pr um, produce a multi-point test, which is um, how much air we require to pump into the building at different pressure points. So we cover a wide range of conditions. You can interpret that as um, different wind condition or um, how um, much pressure, how hard you want to run your mechanical system. But it needs to be on a different on a number of pressure points. One of the reasons is um, certain flips or window lock or door or door closer, they may not perform when you increase the pressure. They may just give way and open up. So if you do a multi-point test, you get a better understanding on your building under various conditions. And whether all the penetration are prepared according to standard. There are some opening we are allowed to tape up, but some other we need to remain open. All the standards have their definition. Um, for example, mechanical system. If, there, if that is a 24-7 continuously ventilation system, we are allowed to tape that up because 
in during wheel operation, it is always functioning. So we want to take that out of the equation when we test the building envelopes performance. And verifiable ambient weather condition, if outside, inside temperature difference and the wind, we need to have proper record of all those, preferably from a um, Bureau of Meteorology site nearby, so we know what ambient condition is. And a fully automated test can take out human error, and also it um, ensure the quality of the data. Because in the good old day when we do manual testing, we run the fan, we use a gauge, we try to take a um, one minute, 15 minute, 10 minutes average reading and adjust the flows to know how much flow we need to pump in to, the, to create certain pressure in the building. It's good, but in the fully automated system, the computer will lock the pressure and flow for every second. So we know whether there is a high variance during the test. You, you may got a lovely number from a five minute average, but who knows what happened in between the five minutes. If you're using manual method, you ask the manometer to do a five minute average, you just read the number, write it down, and it calculates great. But it could be someone in between, open the door, the pressure suddenly dropped for like five seconds, and you don't know. But for a fully automated test, it logs every single second, so you can check back to the graph and see if there's any unexpected things happen, and it ensures the integrity of the results. Okay, during the test day, we need to prepare all the openings, um, constant extraction needs to be sealed, access needs to be provided, and preferably, we can have the mechanical installer presence as well. If the test goes smooth, it's great, but if the test results just not what we expected, we need to do something called a troubleshooting, trying to locate where the leaks are, and in most cases, it's something to do with the mechanical system that the dampers are not properly shut where they should, and it allows a lot of air just rushing out. So it messes up our results and give the building a worse result. So if they can be present, we can try to go through things quickly and do some troubleshooting. Tips to achieve good outcome, you need to get the builder to find someone as the air tightness champion. He needs to overlook all the different trays and going around and do inspection after inspection and even more inspection. Once again, it's all about vigilance and finding, seeing all the gaps and cracks and make sure they are sealed up. No rocket science. There's nothing like a magic spray you can put on, although we are developing one, trying to. <laughs> and you need to educate the trades. Need to sit down with them, organize someone like us or a um, specialist expertise knows about the things, sit down, discuss with them, let them know why we need to do it and how to do it. Once they got an idea, they will make at least 70% of the things right. There would still be a little bits and pieces here and there they miss, but it's better than from zero or even negative. If you don't educate them sometimes, even though you put a perfect membrane on the wall and the sparky comes in, oh, I need to put a power outlet there. Let me get my standing knife, chop. All the work is gone. And well-defined air barrier and who is responsible for which part? It just comes back to where I started. And our experience, here is um, some of the projects that we did in a little bit earlier or the two or three years in the past. And the solid bar is the permeability test result. And the blue frame is if the project has a target to achieve, that's the target. And you can see all the red projects 
are the projects that we just got dragged in in the last minute to perform the test. And you see, well, some of them doing slightly better, but still not quite hitting the target. And the green one is we got brought into the project earlier, not early enough, just earlier, when the builder already got won the tender, then they get us to get in to do um, trade workshop, sitting down and educate the trade, doing regular inspection on site. And you can see most of the time we achieve the target except for this one. And the reason why that one we are not quite achieving the result is because they didn't bring us in early enough. If they bring us in even earlier, we can evaluate the design and certain details. In some building where in the tender stage it's already too late to change certain fundamental issue, and this is one of them, so bad luck, but we already try our best to bring it so close to the target. Okay, what can we help? Any questions? And I was going to talk a little bit about dark work, but let's do it next time. <laughs>